Welcome to the Action Shooting Show. Tonight we have Mark Redkey, we have our friend John Drossert, and we are here to talk about the uh, 2024 Badger Trekker. And my, Mark, do you know the name of this range? Because you're from this part of the world. <laughs> it's like Akamanawak. A- Akamanawak. It's the Akamanawak Sportsman's Club. Akamanawak. Akanama- that's how right? I would. That's how I would have pronounced it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, um, and that's in what, Wisconsin? Halfway between Madison and Milwaukee. So, so yeah. if you know that part of the country, I, I have no clue. I've never been up there. So there's a lot of Canada light. That's kind of up in Canada light where the people who are just a little more freedom loving than Canadians stay. So Mark, Mark knows all about that. <clears throat> All right, so um, first off, do you, Mark, do you want to share what divisions and maybe your idea of the match flavor, and then we'll kind of get um, John's opinion on match flavor. So for those watching, I did not shoot this match. Uh, the other two did, so I'm just going to kind of lead the conversation and let them do most of the talking, which I'm sure you're all happy about. So what what's the uh, divisions and match flavor? So no divisions. There was a 5K and a 10K. So you picked your distance and did one or the other. And then match flavor, I think I said this last year, pretty much traditional run and gun. You know, not any crazy CrossFit stuff, not any, uh, you know, DMR or special long range shooting. It's just 300 yards, run a pistol, run a rifle, run a 5K. And so pretty standard kind of meat and potatoes run and gun, I'd say. And then if you're a real man, you like John, you did the 10K. And what what are your thoughts on the match flavor of the 10K or anything maybe they added on that part? Yeah, so my thoughts on the 10K um, were, and I, I said this in a post on the discussion page, um, that it's a really grassroots running gun. Like it feels like old school, original running gun um, where some of the running guns these days have gone to making it hard just for the sake of making it hard or adding you have to move weight or do extra things that are a little more tactical games ask um and badger trekker really wasn't that it was just a a good test of your gear your equipment your fitness um just in a go run in the woods and shoot stages uh kind of build Awesome. I, and, I, and I like matches like that. I don't think we have to go out of our way to make things ridiculously hard. Or I, I don't mind some physical stuff added in, but I definitely don't want it CrossFit. And if you got, you know, competitors moving 250 pounds weights, like that's that's kind of past the point of practical for, for most people. Although I guess that is a skill you should have in life. But um, it, it's nice. There's still some just like just move around and shoot and get that done type matches in that are going on. All right. So, and we'll start with Mark again, um, gear used. What, uh, what kind of loadout did you have for this match? So I ran pretty much my stri- standard run and gun. I've got a, um, chest rig with two rifle mags and a pistol mag, and then a competition belt holster, two pistol mags and a rifle mag. And then I run a camel back, small camel back and i had an extra pistol mag in there uh i also carried uh knee pads and gloves and i didn't use either of them we did have a little bit of crawling and stuff like that but it was always in grass and so i tried not to shred my knees too bad and so it wasn't didn't feel like i needed them there but pretty much my standard go-to just um, belt chest rig and then camel back so what, how much did you wear? Did you say how much you wore on your chest rig? Like what mags you had on your chest rig? Yeah. So two rifle, one pistol. And then um, I ran my 16 inch AR with a one to six Razor Gen 2 and then Glock 17 with RMR. Yep. So that's any besides for the ammo amount of ammo he had. That's pretty much a rig that I, I, you could shoot just about any running gun in the country with. I mean, that's that's pretty standard. How about you, John? 
Um, so I may or may not be having some connection issues here. So if I cut it in and out, I apologize. Um, I ran my uh, 12.3 AR-15 um, and my Canic SFX rival. Um, I carried five rifle mags because I move slow enough to carry an extra doesn't really hurt me. Um, and I believe I carried eight pistol mags, seven pistol mags. Um, I carry everything on my hip. Uh, and in a camelback. So I have three rifle, four pistol on my hip, and I carry two extra rifle, three extra pistol in my camelback. Um, yeah, that was my basic loadout. I ran for the first time ever in running shoes and shorts, uh, which was a very freeing experience. Uh, normally I have some heavier hiking boots and lawn pants on that get, you know, heavy as they get wet and the 10 K had some extra stuff that the five K didn't, um, with, a, an obstacle of a, uh, a culvert crawl after just crossing, uh, not necessarily dirty, but not the cleanest, you know, not really moving in water Creek. Um, so it was, it was nice to be nice and light and just kind of let that slough off on the other side. Yeah, I like the running shoes, uh, but I, I usually wear long pants for various stuff like that. But it kind of depends on the train. It sounds like it, it's a lot more just grass fields and kind of open train there and less uh, bushwhacking thick woods and that sort of thing. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, they're in the southern prairie-esque, you know, kind of rolling prairie of southern Wisconsin. Um, so... You, had a good mix of running through some hardwood forests and some open fields and marshlands uh, that the Sportsman's Club there uh, manages for wildlife and various other purposes. Um, so the trails that they had were all, you know, brush hogged and grass that was probably five inches tall. Um, so just tall enough that you wanted to be sure of where you were putting your foot down, but um, not so much as to be running through, you know, houndstone and briars and all that kind of stuff either. Yeah, yeah, and that's really where the long pants come in. If if you're getting a lot of that thick briary and, you know, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee woods, there's thorns on apparently every plant that grows in there. So, um all right, so we'll start off uh, with the stages, going through the stages here. So stage one, Mark, you want to describe that for us? Yeah, stage one um, was in a pistol bay. You started with a rope in your hand. Like imagine the thick rope that you climb in gym class. No one does that anymore, but you can imagine it. <laughs> uh, and it's 50 feet long. And on the end of it is a 45-pound kettlebell. And so you ran from one side of the bay to the other until the rope was tight. And then you pulled hand over hand this kettleball all the way to over a line. Once it crossed the line, then you shot twice with your rifle and put your rifle back down on the table and then ran to the other side of the bay. When the rope was tight, pull the kettlebell back over, then shoot pistol, two targets, Set your pistol down, run back over with the rope, pull it back, two more rifle, back again, two more pistol. So uh, as close to, you know, we were just talking, it's not CrossFit, but as, as physical as you get in terms of like burn your arms out kind of stuff. Um, so that was stage one. Yeah, I mean, kettlebells sound CrossFit, Mark. I think you're lying to me here. <laughs> right. So, um, uh, John, you got anything to add to that? Is he frozen? Oh. Uh, John looks frozen. Hopefully. All right. Get... should be back. Oh. Yep. We hear you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I tried to change sources. So hopefully I have a little bit oh. stronger connection. Okay. Yeah. You got anything to add about stage one there? Um, yeah, no, it was uh, it was one. My wife also ran the event, and as I was, you know, dragging that kettlebell across the 
uh, Bay, I was just sitting there thinking, man, she's going to hate this. Uh, <laughs> and I was right. She did, but she managed to complete it. So it was, it was a good, um, warm up, you know, mental game to was get yourself ready. Like it, it was immediately in my head, like, is this what every stage is going to be like? Cause this is going to be really hard. You know? Um, I also had the, uh, when I was on stage one, I, I pulled up a little bit. I wasn't running quite as fast. Cause I was like, you know, I, I know a couple match directors that would make the rope just slightly shorter than this run distance. So I was halfway expecting my shoulder to get yanked back, uh, as I was running, but, uh, it wasn't, it was the full length that it needed to be. So they were nice about that. Um, they did use a rope that I've personally felt was a little bit stretchy. So, uh, you had to pull a little, little harder, but you also got a little bit of bounce when it actually did let go. So, so people were arguing if it got easier or harder as the kettlebell was, was digging a trench into the dirt. And even on your own, like your passes as you went, you would watch it fill up with dirt and you just kept thinking like, this is getting worse as I'm pulling it. Uh, so that was kind of a fun, terrible thing to look at. Uh, but the, the shooting was very easy. The shooting was just like two bowling pins for rifle and then two small plates for pistol. So it was pretty much all about how fast you could move the, the kettlebell. So. Well, and I've done stuff at heartbreak like that, where you're like pulling something, except instead of a kettlebell, I think it was like a block of concrete or something like that. And, yeah, it was dug in enough that, like, it was almost pulling me. You know, I'm on the ground, like, both feet trying to yank it up over. So a, a kettlebell is not a bad way to do that because at least it's round and you're less likely to have a corner catch in and rip your arms off when you, you know, or pull you off the ground. So, all right, uh, from there, uh, I guess take us to stage two. So stage two was out in the swamp. You, it was pistol only. You were shooting across the drainage ditch that you had to cross if you were in the 10K. And it was just like two pistol, steel. And I think you had to go back and forth, like one, two, three, four. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you moved to another position. Then there was like three steel. You had to go one, two, three, four, five, six. You kind of, you couldn't double tap them is what I'm trying to say. You had to shoot them down the row and then run to another position and three more targets, same thing. So it was eight targets shot twice each, but you couldn't double tap them from three positions. So pretty straightforward. Yeah, there was also an obstacle between stages one and two that you had to do. Um, it was about a 15 foot, maybe 20 foot low crawl. Um, pretty standard for that loop. Uh, the second loop also had an obstacle at that location that we can get into later. Um, yeah, uh, I, I kind of struggled with this stage, this stage, not from a shooting aspect. Um, but I'm the reason the stage brief changed. So, um, (laughs) because in, in the stage brief originally, the, the RO said, don't double tap. So my brain locked on to double tap. So I double tapped everything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it wasn't until I got to the second target array that they're like, no, no, no double taps. And I was like, you said double tap. You said, I said, don't double tap. Um, so that was just a, a little bit of a communication um, challenge. Uh, but I, I believe by competitor day, they had switched that to, you know, one hit each, then do it again, kind of a brief instead of, because as soon as you, and any experience RO knows this. As soon as you put a keyword like double tap in your shooter's head, that's exactly what's going to happen. They're going to double tap the target. Um, and that's that's what I did because it's faster to shoot targets that way, but it's just harder to RO. So I understand why they did it that way, um, too. And they were uh, just yeah. close enough that you could rip them. You could really double tap them. Yeah. Yeah. You could really burn it down. Um, it was, it was a fun little stage with a little bit of movement, you know, shooting across a little bit of water, um, where the sun could, could kind of change your view, you know, and the glare on the targets. Um, RO day was 
the only time I think I've ever been to an RO day that the weather was perfect. Um, so that didn't really come into effect for the ROs, but when the, uh, sun was out in full force on competitor today, that could have played a little bit of a factor too. Yeah, you're right though. If you say don't something, no one hears don't, they just hear whatever's coming after it. So, you know, don't walk over that line. Don't double tap. They're going to do exactly what you you tell them to do. And uh, I agree as an RO, double taps, uh, anything that people have to shoot multiple times in a row, with the better competitors, it gets really, really hard to RO it because their splits are so quick. You can't call it. And and I have seen it, and, and uh, even good shooters sometimes, they think they got two hits, so they moved on. I know they only got one hit. But they've moved on, and now I got to say no. You you're missing a hit there, and then you're arguing with someone on the clock, and they're pissed off you afterwards. And um, so I think just shooting. If you want them to shoot it twice, have them shoot all through it, and then come back. I think that's a good a good way to do it. So um, yeah, and counter that. You, every now and then you end up with a shooter like Sean Murphy that's double tap three targets before you could call the first hit. So. Yeah. Oh no, that's what I'm saying. And then there's guys that can double tap it all really, really quick. Um, the problem is if they miss, it, it's right. hard to stay on top, on top of that. So, um, yeah, generally I don't like having to shoot the same target multiple times unless it's paper. It's something you can score like that. So, right. All right. So, uh, what we'll switch up. So we'll go on to stage three here, John, you want to kind of explain that first here for us? Uh, stage three was, where was stage three? Right by the bend in the road all pistol oh yeah yeah yeah. um stage three was a uh kind of a speed plate rack stage um mark you might explain it better than i can because i can visualize it but i can't remember the order of events um but it was there were some silhouettes in each corner and then a center target you had to get a hit on those and then once you got that if I remember correctly, you had to move forward about 10 yards um, and then engage two six plate, eight inch plate racks. Um, so a relatively, Mark, did I get that right first? Yeah, yep, essentially. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a big swing across the bay, you know, left target, right target, center target, move forward. Eight inch plate racks, six targets across, two of them, you know, staggered on either side of the bay. Um, just a good, fun, burn it down stage uh, that was doable for most shooters. Um, and then the, the more experienced running gunners that are used to slightly smaller targets, you know, were able to just really have fun and throw the gas pedal down and put down solid runs and fast times. Yeah, I screwed that. I was not one of those people that put down a fast time. I screwed that one up. So one of the things, and I was reflecting on this, I don't know if this is really true, but two of the things I was trying to manage this match was sweat and my heart rate. And I'm going to blame this on maybe a rumor, RO rumor, is that we were told you had to go all the way down to the gate. You were supposed to run by three go to the gate and come back to three. And I don't know which way, which order you did it in, but when I got to three, they stopped me and they were like, no, you come do three right now. Yeah. And so I, we had just come the smallest hill for any run and gun, but it was up and down a hill and then stage three was there. And so I felt like I was not where I wanted to be heart rate and my hands were slippery. And so I kind of sucked on that stage, which like John said, should have just been, burn it down kind of stage but yeah i i um i shot it the same way you did i came down that hill and they snagged me right away and were like now you shoot stage three and then you go to the gate um and it was one where like i feel like the amount of running guns that i've gone to was a disadvantage for me at this point 
Um, because I looked at the array and I looked at the target size and my brain was like, I can shoot this all from here. I don't need to move. And <laughs> so I got through those first three targets, you know, and I'm starting to pull up on the plate rack and the RO is like, no, you have to move. You got to move forward. So I, it took my brain a second to process that and then to move. So I lost a little bit of time there. Um, I think I ended up putting down like the third fastest time on that stage or something like that. Um, so had I just listened, but so far stage two and three were me not listening correctly <laughs> um, to the RO stage brief. Uh, and I even repeated this one back to him. I was like, so I do this, this, and this, and then I move and then I do this. He's like, yep. And then I, it went beep and it went out and I just started shooting. I was like, oh, these plate racks look fine from, you know, 30 yards or whatever we were at. <laughs> Well, and that's, I mean, that's the big thing with run and gun is that you get a little bit of, you know, a little bit of heart rate raised, a little bit of sweaty and stuff that you should be, if it was a three gun stage or a USPSA stage or something where, you know, you're just standing there and then you walk up, you would crush it, but you get a little bit of extra stuff going on and that stuff goes straight out the window. So, um, yeah, well, I mean, we've all we've all definitely been there. So I don't I don't think we talked about this in the um, kind of match flavor. But am I correct in that most of these stages are in bays? There, there's not a lot of natural terrain up there. It's it just kind of tends to be bay shooting. So there was two that were out of the bays. The number stage mm. two, or no, yeah, two that were out of the bays. So stage two shooting out in the kind of the swamp across the ditch and then stage five that John and Tiger are owed. They were out in the woods. Uh, so the rest, I think we're all in bays. And that, yeah. I mean, that kind of makes sense to the, the area and the terrain, you know, if you go like Legion, when you go down to Legion, it's mostly natural terrain stages and you got lots of Hills and, and stuff like that, that you can do that. Um, so here in Ohio, most of the we don't have a lot of running gun, but most of the three gun things you're doing, there's very little natural terrain. We just we just don't have it's it's a lot of Ohio is too flat. Kentucky again, you go down there, you can shoot some natural terrain in places because they have hills and you know the Appalachians and so. But I, I thought I remember from last year that this was kind of mostly a a bay type stage situation, which there's nothing wrong with that. You can set up really great stages in a bay, so. Um, yeah another thing to remember about this property too is it's it's only 80 acres so the vast majority of their property is bays um and you know it's it's a club range so most of what they could get approved to use is bay shooting um and you know another part of this club is you know members for the club can hunt on the property so they didn't want to have a whole bunch of rounds being sent out in the outskirts you know out in the marshes you have wetland concerns all that kind of stuff um if they can keep it to where there's normally gunfire um less likely to disturb the other aspects of the sportsman's club as well absolutely and i love i love that they're doing that because i i think a lot of people have this idea that you need a place you know, this big sprawling land, like back in the day we shot in rock castle and everything was natural terrain and you have hills and valleys and mountains and, you know, and you don't need that to do a successful run again. I mean, 80 acres is not definitely not a large, um, range for as far as ranges are concerned, but they've got, a, they're able to squeeze 10 K in there and yeah, you're doing loops or you're malt, you know, you're doing the same thing, but they, they're switching things up. I know, John said the first time they went through, they had one obstacle. We're going to talk about the next obstacle. That's a, um, it's nice to see people kind of thinking creatively and saying like, this is what we've got. We're going to make do with, we're going to make it happen and make a really good match with what we got and not just say like, oh, well, if I had, you know, a thousand acres of land and this and this, you know, I could do one like, no, you've, you've got, you may have the land or the property or the range right there. You just have to think maybe outside the box of what, what we're doing, what, what most people do. So I, I think that's, that's really awesome. So Mark, do you want to go over the next? I think we're on, is it stage four next? Yeah. So four was really basic. Um, you came in kind of after a decent run as far as the property goes. 
And it was just pistol only, stand in a box, shoot a steel plate at 10, 12 yards, uh, maybe an 8-inch plate, and then run 15, 20 yards over to another box, shoot an 8-inch steel plate, run back, shoot a steel plate. I think he went back and forth 12 times. Uh, so mostly it was how fast you could move box to box, get in position, break that shot, get moving again. And they, the thing that I talked about with one of the other ROs is at 12 times, like 10 times you're pretty gassed. And those extra couple times are the ones that really where you start dropping shots, at least for me. Uh, but that stage went pretty well. I thought I was moving really fast, but some people really smoked that stage. So it was good. Well, and looking at the list, um, there were some pretty, I mean, for people that don't know, this happened the same weekend as Legion. Um, they had picked a this weekend, and uh, Legion ended up kind of surprising everyone by switching weekends. Um, I, and I guess they had they were trying to get more special forces. Not doing it on the uh, uh, September 11th weekend was they thought would be better, and end up being the same weekend, which um, kind of split some of the shooting community because. Um, there's people that normally shoot Legion. I know that was up there and, and vice versa, but, um, um, there were some heavy hitters still up there. I mean, you guys had some pretty solid shooters still shooting, shooting the match. Your, your guys included in that, but, um, John, John, what do you think of that stage? Yeah. So when I heard this stage, um, I, I personally refer to this stage as the Riverbend shuffle. Um, because it's, it's a staple at Riverbend run and gun to do some form of sprint across, grab your rifle, make some hits, sprint back across, grab your pistol, make some hits. Um, those guys, Bruce Perry and the team down there at Riverbend, like they, they really got this one down to a science. Um, and, uh, Badger Trekker did a really good job of replicating, them. um, to to the point that i knew exactly what the stage was while i was getting the brief you know um the only thing that badger did differently is badger did it as the entire stage was pistol so you had to manage your muzzle as you moved um river bend has uh drop boxes and it's a rifle pistol um so it's a great stage it gets your heart rate up it makes sure that you can you know pull a trigger correctly you know even when you're tired um because once you start getting really gassed like it's one of those stages where it doesn't really matter how fast you moved coming up to the stage your heart rate's going to get up anyway and by the second half of the stage you're sucking wind and you know because you're pushing yourself to be as fast as possible so um it, it's a really good stage from that aspect of just trigger discipline muzzle control making good hits when you're tired uh, it's it's a pretty hard stage to beat for that, and I'm I was happy to see it make it to the other, you know, the northern end of the country, coming all the way from Georgia. So. Yeah, that's that's uh that's awesome. I have not shot Riverbend yet. That's that's kind of on the list because um there's I know last year Bruce didn't have quite as much in it, but that's kind of you know what he started, and I, there's still some really good people putting that match on down there. So, Mark, uh, what do you think of that stage? Yeah, it was fun. I Like I said, I thought I was moving, and then I saw the scores. I was like, I wasn't moving that fast. I could have moved faster, you know? Like, But like John said, I was zonked at the end. Like, that was – I put everything I could into sprinting back and forth. And, yeah, it was it was a good one. I liked it. Yeah, that's uh, uh, moving on a stage is always a balance because, um, you know, uh, a good example, Guardian, uh, quite a few years had a stage where you'd always run up these like three flights of stairs and sometimes with like weight or something like that and shoot off the, the third level of this big trap um, tower, whatever. Now, if you just full bore like 100 percent, like rip up those stairs and then try to shoot rifle, you know, at 100 yards. Like it, it's going to, it could be very, even resting, it could be very rough. I mean, you could just be smoked. Um, so there's always that balance because if you just walk up and it doesn't matter how fast you shoot, if you, if it takes you twice as long to get up. So um, there's a, uh, 
always a balance in running gun between moving quick on a stage, but not moving so quick that you can't you can't shoot well. Um, yep. So that um, so is that stage? We're at stage five now, right? Yep. Was that your last stage for the five k mark, or is there one more? No, five k went all the way to stage six. So if John okay, will take five because he ro'd it. Okay. Yeah. So stage yeah. five was my stage. Um, it was uh, it was good fundamental positional shooting. Um, there were eight targets. Um, there were three three inch throughs on a rack at about twenty yards, um, testing your height over bore, and then at um ranging between 60 and 65 yards back in the tree line so that this was one of the areas where we weren't in a bay um they had uh brush hogged out a field and cut some trees uh some brushy trees out of the way um to create some shooting lanes just kind of back in the woods uh and they had it set up uh there was uh, uh will henry had some pretty creative target stands uh, that I was honestly pretty impressed with because of how budget friendly they were. Um, usually a lot of, you know, target stands and hangers and stuff like that can be kind of cost prohibitive for new matches and that kind of stuff. And um, Will Henry, one of the match directors up there uh, did a really good job of finding um, budget friendly ways to do that. So uh, that was impressive. And he had, extras you know he he did it on a budget so he knew the likelihood of things failing were high um and he had extras sitting there for when they did fail we were able to just pop and swap them out um but it was uh three different locations between 60 and 65 uh with um eight inch plates uh two of them hanging side by side uh two-thirds ipsic in the middle i believe it was and a uh, two more eight inch plates hanging side by side. Um, and when I say side by side, like they were within two feet of each other. Um, the challenge on this stage, um, the throughs got the inexperienced guys, of course, not knowing height over bore. Um, the bigger challenge was they had three red no shoots, um, to indicate that, Hey, there's targets in this general area. Um, and it was in our stage brief that, you know, Hey, those are no shoots. Don't shoot them. They're just indicating that there's targets in the area. Um, and a lot of people one shot those no shoots, uh, because again, it was, you know, going back to, if you tell them not to do something, they're going to do it. Uh, but the, the no shoots were in front of the tree line where the sun could really make them pop. Um, and the, the plates that, you know, they, they had them painted to start the day, but by, you know, the 10th shooter hitting it 24 times, you know, um, not a whole lot of paint left, became steel colored steel in a shaded environment. Um, so you were shooting from shade into shade with a bright, sunny field in between you. Um, really posed some challenges for shooters when it came to target acquisition um, and the positioning. Uh, there was a there was a log that was laying down. Um, horizontally uh, perpendicular to the range that you had to shoot. You had to be in contact with that log shooting prone. Um, then there was a, a veed tree uh, next to that. You had to shoot from standing, being in contact with that tree. Um, and there was a little sawhorse off to the right-hand side of that tree. You had to shoot from kneeling um, on that. It was one hit each on any of the target or on all of the targets, all eight targets from each shooting position, um, you could start at whatever shooting position you chose. Um, so it was up to you to game plan for that stage. Yeah, that sounds like, so it's that one's, so that's rifle. You said that's rifle only. Yeah. On that. Yeah. That, I mean, positional stuff is, is important to practice and the throughs as we see time and time again, I mean, I, I had a three gun match today. I put on, that had throughs and afterwards we had a new shooter and I, he was on a different squad and I talked to him beforehand. I said, Hey, so how'd it go? You know, you have fun. He's like, Oh yeah. 
great, going to be back. I, I guess I need to practice shooting two-inch targets with rifle. <laughs> so I said, yeah, those those will uh, those will get you. For um, I don't know if it's going to come out before or after this one. I actually made a video recently, kind of a little tutorial on Throom's. Um, maybe some tips and tricks for shooting them for, for people, just uh, things they can practice or kind of set you up for success. So um, we'll, we'll have that out in the show, the channel here soon. Mark, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, that Steve was terrible. That's my thoughts. <laughs> I got the worst time of day. Not the worst. I'm sure other people got terrible too. But my time of day with the shadows, I could not see those targets at all. I wish I had video. Of it, the stage was mostly me arguing with John and Tiger about the existence of the targets. And so from the first position, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, I see the, the no shoots. They're like, yeah, they're there. You can imagine Tiger's like, they're there. Come on. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So I'm essentially just shooting into the woods, hoping steel bangs. And it wasn't. And I zoomed in. You know, this is like John said, 60, 70 yards. And I had it on like 2x. I zoom my scope into 6x. I'm not seeing anything. When I could finally see him, this is, I guess, I shouldn't say this because this is bad practice, but I took off my shooting glasses that were sunglasses, and then I could see them enough to make hits. And, you know, you're shooting at steel, you shouldn't have your glasses off, but I could not see the targets until I did that. And then another little trick. Um, for kind of new shooters that you wouldn't think of is when you lay down on the log, if you lay down like in the middle of the log where you'd naturally think to plop down, you couldn't see the far left targets. And so you had to kind of scooch over to get all the targets from all the positions. And it's one of those little things, you know, like talk about what can you help new shooters with? Like go to the place where you can see as much as you can. Um, Another one, we had talked about it before the show, is admin reloads. So like John said, it's a 24-shot stage. If you have dropped shots, you should maybe think about reloading. Now, I didn't think about reloading because I didn't realize, you know, I maybe had shot five or six times before I'd even found the targets. And so I did a reload on my belly in the dirt. Uh, so that didn't help me. That was by far my worst stage. Of all the stages I could do over, that one is the clear do-over for me, but uh, it was a it was an interesting stage. It was a good stage, but yeah, that was my, yeah, my I mean, overall thoughts. <laughs> if um if you think shooting without eye pro is not a good idea, wildly shooting into a tree line <laughs> when you can't see <laughs> is also not standard practice. Um, and this is the thing. Normally, I would tell people like, well, this is why you should be shooting an LPVO because shooting from shadow into shadow with stuff like iron sights and red dots is really, really challenging. But, you know, he said he's got razor gin too. It's hard to find nicer, clear glass on a scope than a, than a razor scope. I mean, the gin twos, particularly the one to six or one to six is a phenomenal glass. So if you're having trouble seeing that, like that's, that's saying a lot because that, those gather light really well. And generally that's my big argument for LPVOs is seeing like you, you can cut into shade better than the naked eye, but not obviously not always. And I think if anyone shot running gun for a while, uh, last year at Legion, I got to a stage real late as I'm always one of the last ones on the course on RO day. And the sun was just coming through trees and there's just a bunch of steel there and it's just right in your eyes. And every time you move, you get another bit and it's just like, I couldn't see it. And the RO was like that, you know, he's like, yeah, that sucks. He said the the visual, like I know where they're at and I could barely see where everything was at because of like how the lighting is right now. So that's kind of the part of natural terrain being out in the um, outside and doing the sport is that sometimes you get pouring down rain and rained on. And sometimes you got, you shoot the stage with the absolute best weather possible. So yeah. it makes, it makes it a challenge. Stage five was a, a learning experience for a lot of people when it came to equipment. Um, Cause like Mark, I ran a PST uh, gen two, one to six, which is an, another vortex scope, just a cheaper version um, of the one that Mark is running. I didn't have any trouble, um, but I also chose different iPro. Uh, the folks that had issues um, 
the most common issues came with uh, dark shaded eye protection. So sunglass eye protection um, or uh, red dots and irons had a really hard time. Um, they just couldn't see across that bright sunny field in the middle. Um, we as ROs cleared very early on with the match directors to be able to provide as much assistance as we could. Um, the match directors really wanted people to be able to complete their stages. Uh, so we were, you know, as basically as soon as somebody got past, you know, the top time or to where we knew they weren't even remotely close to the top time, we pretty well started saying, you know, hey, it's right here. Like, find the diamond. It's above and behind that by about 15 yards. Like, you're looking for rounds. You're looking for an Ipsic. You know, the Ipsic was easy to find. Everybody could find that one. Um, it was down a bowling alley, basically. Like, it was right out in the middle, but there were the two, the two teed eight inch gongs on either side of that, um, that really gave some people a, a challenge. Um, and that, that too, part of it was how Will Henry had designed those hangers. Um, you were basically looking for a three foot long two by four. There wasn't a plate rack or like a T post that was really visible. Um, so you were just kind of trying to find a two by four and hit the two eight inch plates hanging below it. Um, but again, shade to shade in a dark area in the woods, you know, you're looking for wood in the woods. So <laughs> not, and they were, the, it, it was a challenging stage for, for everybody, I think. Um, and the, the positional stuff is always fun, you know, moving on the clock, um, admin reloads like Mark touched on were, um, were important on this stage. Uh, there were a lot of times where people went to transition into the final shooting position and got down to one or two targets and ran dry um, and ended up, you know, not having a mag ready to go or they had they had drawn their mag or they had loaded for the stage with their mag that was their easiest access. So now they're trying to dig through their chest rig or really reach behind them um, or even, you know, retreating to their pack to grab a new mag. Uh, stuff like that, like come to a stage, you know, ready to have to reload at least once. Uh, that's just kind of my general opinion on it, but because you never really know what you're going to run into. You might run into a stage that's 33 hits. What are you going to do? You know, right. I was just going to add that part of the way those hangers worked is they had, when he says looking for two by four, they had two by four in front of the hangers to protect them. And so they were kind of occluded. Like you didn't see a full eight inch circle. Would you say that's right? You know, you kind of yeah. saw like a half moon underneath. Yeah, it, it was kind of like a three quarter moon of the eight inch circle. So you probably had closer to like a seven inch circle worth of target space. Uh, so he was yeah, he was it, trying to protect the hardware then. Is that yeah, what I'm yeah. gathering? Like the stand was designed to kind of protect the hardware. Yeah. That's a good um, something I just thought about while you're talking about this, and we didn't talk about it beforehand. So, um, could you run with? I'm, I'm assuming rifle was cold, like most matches. Could you run with a hot pistol or not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you had hot choice. They they allowed every stage allowed for you to load, make ready um, beforehand. There are some running guns where if you choose to run cold, you shoot the stage how you showed up. Um, that was not the case at Badger. They wanted to be new shooter friendly. They wanted everybody to be comfortable. Um, I saw a lot of guys, uh, myself included that are very experienced running gunners that ran cold, uh, just because we had the option to, so why not be safer? You know, um, I liked that personally. I liked giving people the opportunity to load, um, beforehand and, I don't really think it ever caused any backups. You know, people are pretty proficient with reloading. So, yeah. yeah. And that's, I think that's the big argument. If you're really trying to go get people through quickly, loading on the clock tends to be faster. But so, and the reason I ask that is you guys are absolutely right. So, if you have time to load right before the stage starts, you know, first, if you're coming into a stage, make sure you have know where your full mags are. Like, have a, a full rifle and a full pistol. And ideally, I like to have two full rifles and two full pistols. 
at least at minimum, you know, and it depends on where you're at in the match, but, but know which one you're going to load in first, you know, if it's off the clock, which one you're going to load in. And like, if I'm running a chest rig, I'm loading something off my chest rig. And then my belt still has a full rifle and a full pistol. And I'm going to load those full off my chest rig because generally there's not a time where it's not faster to just load off a belt than is off chest rig. Chest strings just tend to be slower. So as these guys were kind of allu- alluding to, like, uh, understand that you may have to reload in a mat in a stage and kind of plan for that. And don't just like, like if you pull it off your belt and now I have nothing on my belt and I got to load off a chest rig. Well, generally that's slower. But in this case, if you're going prone at the end and you think you may need to load, you, you may want to load off a chest rig. That chest rig possibly could be easier. I, I don't, I've messed around with it. I still think the belt, you know, rolling and doing the belts probably quicker, but um, that's things to practice at home. You can, you can dry fire both of those, but um, that, that's a good point. Make, you may have to reload, even if it's a really short stage. Um, malfunctions. If I'm in a stage and I have a pistol malfunction, generally I'm stripping that mag out and I'm just, or dropping it out, racking it and I'm loading a new mag. Like I'm not going to mess around with trying to, clear it and then load because maybe that magazine's the reason it malfunctioned. I'm just going to go to another one. That's things to kind of think about and prepare for before you get up to a stage and not just, uh, you know, like these guys saying, well, you're loading a half empty mag and then you're got to reload. Now I got to figure out where a magazine is on my body. That's, that's not the quick way to, to shoot a stage. So anything else on that one before we go to stage six? Yeah. I just had one thing, I guess I had two things. On to stage five, to put it in perspective how bad it went for people like me and the guy that ran right before me, we shot in the 50% of winners on that stage. And then on the next stage, which was the long range, the guy that ran before me won it, and the I got like fourth. And so imagine me being a 50% shooter, and then 200, 300 yards later, I'm the top and, you know, the other guy was the top shooter. So, I mean, it was totally light dependent. And that's kind of the nature of the game. Like you said, it could be raining, could be windy. You don't know what you're going to get. But, yeah, the the light just killed us on that one. And then going back to pistols for a second, cold pistols. One thing to think about beyond just like, oh, my gun's never going to fall out. One thing that's unique about running a gun is obstacles. We belly crawled three times if you were 10k you went up a tube and i had my pistol snag on like the tarp or like they had paracord holding down a tarp while you're belly crawling now i have a retention holster but if you don't and you snag on something or you're belly crawling and that pistol's out if that's loaded gun on the ground you're dq so if you get the option there's some arguments to be made for for not running hot. I ran hot and I didn't have a problem, but like I said, I hung up on the one belly crawl and I had to like reach back and undo the paracord. So. Yeah. And I would say if you're shooting run and gun and uh, Safari land makes an ALS for your gun and you're not shooting it, I would reconsider what holster you're using and like what good reason that is because the ALS and, uh, I get a little flack sometimes, but the the omnivore, the Blackhawk omnivore, depending on if, if ALS doesn't make one, the omnivore on most guns is a really, really solid option as well. The, these are both active retention holsters. So you can get retention holsters like the older hoop style holsters that, you know, the little hood goes up over, but you've got to flip that up. This uh, omnivore, the ALS, um, I don't know if anyone else makes one but as soon as you toss that in as soon as it's fully holstered that thing clicks in and you you know it takes a lot to get that out without pressing the button so um all right so we got uh up to stage six is there uh just a run to that is there any obstacles what what do we got going on on the way to stage six uh stage six the gap between five and six uh was just kind of a run back through the marsh um and you pretty well got straight there. It was only like no, Mark no, no. You guys were in the ago. woods, so that we didn't really explain that. You guys were out in the woods, 
And so if there was any bushwhacking, it was going out to you guys in the woods and coming back. Well, on the, on the 10 K there was a lot of bushwhacking, (laughs) Um, but (laughs) on the 10 K where the 5 K and the 10 K split to get the additional distance on every loop um, on every loop, the 10 K runs slightly farther. Um, And that entire almost that entire extra leg that you run uh, in the 10 K was a trail run. It was a, um, most people that have been around the sport for a while, know Logan Dudley, um, it was a section designed to slow him down. Uh, it didn't work. (laughs) He still smoked it. Um, but that was kind of the feel to it is you wanted to be a little bit more mindful of where you were putting your feet down. You had to crawl under logs, over logs. Um, you're, actively looking for flagging you know it wasn't a nice open mode trail it was you were on deer paths and trying to stay there um which by competitor day and having the ro's kind of beat it down i mean even by my third loop on the 10k uh it was a pretty pretty hammered out you knew where you needed to go um i don't think there were too many people that missed a turn um but i know a couple of the guys before me had really slowed down in that section and had to consciously think of where they were going. Um, but yeah. Uh, and I guess when I say like going between the marsh, like uh, between five and six, you, you got to the gate that was the boundary line of the property. And then you turned into the woods to go out to five. Um, and you kind of had to cross a Creek and through a little boggy area and uh, meander through the woods to get out to where five was that was located between two of the other um bays basically they had just cleared a section of woods behind the berms of the other bays um which is an ro was fun um (laughs) but uh and then once you finish five you just went back out that same trail um and jumped back on the road to get to stage six uh which stage six um was where Mark dumpster fired stage five, stage six was my absolute dumpster fire. If there was something that could go wrong, that could be self-induced, I did it pretty much. Um, so Mark, I don't know, do you want to describe the stage? Yeah, I can. So it's long range. It You start on a platform, you could choose your position. It had railings around it, so you could kneel. You, probably couldn't stand and make all the hits, but you could kneel or you could go prone on this platform that was maybe five feet tall. And you shot, your very first shot was a high value target. It was a hostage terrorist hiding behind a hostage head. And you had to hit the head on the first shot without hitting the no shoot. If you didn't do that, it was a 30 second penalty. And then you move from that to 100 yards, sorry, Hit 100 yards, you had three targets that were like two thirds IP6 or AC zone, smallish, not smallish, but decent size. You had to hit each of those twice. And those you could double tap. Am I correct, John? I feel like. Uh, you, yeah. Yeah, you, you could, could double, double tap, tap these targets. Um, so six hits there, then two, I think, at 200, and then one at 300. No, we, it was one one hit each across, move to two, one hit each, move to three, one hit, hit the three again, and come back. One okay, hit each. sure. And then once you did that, you kept your rifle loaded, r- climbed down off the platform, did a belly crawl underneath a like a low crawl thing, and then there was a tank trap, which is a bunch of, for the people who don't know, a bunch of boards kind of at angles like a Jax or whatever, you know, the old kids toys. And you shot the same long r- distance targets. These you just had to hit one time, right? When you were at yeah. the tank trap. So you yeah, just worked was, your, when you were that up was on, far to in. Yeah, it like was when, when you were top. up on the platform, it was near to far after the HBT. And then you got down, you moved, you did the low crawl, got to the tank bar- barricade and then went far to near. Uh, so it was 12 hits total plus the HVT, so 13. Uh, and like I said, I what, dumpster fired this. So, um, what what was the part time on that? Because that sounds like yeah, there's a decent amount of stuff going on for a uh, 
I mean, as far as movement, you know, from platform to low crawl yeah. to VTAC, it was, was it 120 seconds or? It was a 180 part time. 180. Okay. Um, so an interesting challenge to this, um, they had two stages at Badger um, that even the match directors were a little bit nervous about. They put some experienced ROs on those stages. Uh, there was one on the 5K and the 10K, and there was one on the 10K only. Um, but they had two stages where you had to turn around and run. Um, you had to break that 180 uh, and come back. And this stage was one of them where you had to come down the stairs from the platform. You had to be very conscious of where your muzzle was because um, you were moving and low crawling with a loaded rifle um, on the clock. Uh, they didn't have any incidents. Their ROs did a really good job uh, keeping it safe, making sure everybody understood, you know, muzzle of the sky, muzzle of the ground, whatever it had to be. Um, but yeah, there was a good bit of movement. Um, part of it, too, was the uh, the HVT, the high value target, um, was on RO day. Uh, it's it was a a head size target, right? Uh, and on our O day, they had a sticker of our favorite Russian politician um, on that target, and they had it behind a full size IPSC that was painted bright white with a big red X on it. So when you pulled your scope up, that really <laughs> made it tough to see. Um, by shooter day, that sticker had been obliterated and it was a bright white, nicely painted target. Um, not saying that was easier, but it was easier. <laughs> um, the sticker had fallen and, off by the time I had shot it because they yeah, were so. somebody had taken a picture, like, did you see this? I was like, No, I saw a gray blob out there and I yeah. shot it, shot it the yeah. steel. So I and I, I had a little bit of fun when we got back and I compared the uh shooting scores between myself and Mark. Um, and it, it boiled down to that high value target. Mark hit it and I didn't. Um, so when I took that penalty, <laughs> it pushed Mark over for the win. <laughs> it hurt a lot of people. That penalty hurt a lot of people. And you can yeah, see there's like a line in the scores where it's like everybody's doing okay. And then everyone's got that 30 second penalty. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. A 30 second penalty is no joke. So. Uh, no, and it sounds like so. This would be my putting my match director hat on. Um, it sounds like going from the platform down, that would have been a good time to use that high value target right before they come down. So you have them drop a magazine, they shoot that high value, their gun's clear. Okay, now we can come down, go, you know, go through stuff. We've got an empty gun, and then you can load up again and, and do that. I, I, there's a lot of times I use that if I'm having people retrograde real far up stage and I'm worried about um, guns pointing the wrong way. Like, just have them shoot the gun dry. You know, as long as the magazine, the RO sees the magazine fall and the gun goes off, the gun's empty. Yep. Um, the other thing, and this is my argument, I don't paint, unless it's a no shoot and I'm painting it, I don't paint any steel in my matches because. It's really only fair for the first couple shooters. And by the end of the day, it's all just shot up gray. Um, a good, I know uh, Legion, I don't think they've done it before. Most of the, unless they were trying to hide it for some reason, most of the targets this year at Legion had white backers behind them. So you had like a hanging steel target or whatever, and you had a white backer. So no matter what time of day it was, whether it was raining, whether, you know, you could see very clearly where where a target was at you know and there's still times it was a little harder to see because of environmentals but it was still way better than trying to see a gray and a you know a dark background so um some thoughts out there for people running matches maybe ways to you know try to keep it consistent from the beginning of the match to the end so mark this is where you're done shooting right you've shot all the stages you're going to shoot you're kind of weak so you, you kind of <laughs> called it at the, the 5K, and uh, the real men like John, they, uh, they kept going. So what, what, are we, what, are we, what fun are we getting into next, John? Uh, so Mark actually ROed stages 7 and 8, um, so he can describe them better uh, than I can. They were both fun stages. I had a really good time with them, uh, if you want to describe them, Mark. 
Sure. So seven was you start in a box. This is a pistol only stage. Start in a box, shoot a six inch plate rack at maybe 10, 12 yards, and then run all the way across the bay horizontally to another box where you shot an eight inch plate rack that was a little farther away. It was essentially the same size plates if you consider the distance. And then once you shot that plate rack, you come to the middle and then there were two ipsic steel at kind of a 45 degree angle from each other. So you had to go back and forth and do one, two, three, four, five, six hits going back and forth to finish a stage. And so it was going back to stage three. It was kind of like a speed demons friendly stage with a little bit of running in between. So it was a pretty good stage. Excuse me. Yep. You got anything to add to that, John? From your uh, no, it was, it was fun. It was a turn and burn. It was doable by, you know, new shooters and experienced shooters alike. Um, I, I personally enjoy those stages where, you know, the guys that shoot, you know, and you know they shoot, they can just really burn it down, but your DNF rates are really low because it's doable by everybody. Um, I, I personally think those are fun and your your speed demon guys still have fun because it's coming down to milliseconds between their buddy and them. You know, like that's where you can see who's been training and who hasn't, you know, is those those stages that everybody can do, you know. And it, a lot of them, you know, very often it sets a benchmark. Like those people that completed it but didn't complete it as fast as they wanted to are going to go set up that stage at home because it's a relatively easy one to set up and they're going to practice that. You know, it was, uh, I believe this stage was uh, based on Tiger Schultz's plate rack stage from Zombie. Um, they had, the match directors had named it uh, as such, and that's where they were pulling their inspiration for. It was very similar. It was slightly easier. It was new sh- more new shooter friendly than Tiger tends to be. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was a good stage. It was a fun stage. It was a fast stage. Um, and that keeps shooters moving, and that's good for match directors. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, put my match director hat back on. Later in matches, um, faster, more straightforward stages seem to keep things flowing. If you got stages that people are timing out on or running up to the timeout, it, people bunch up at the end of a match any, or tend to kind of bunch up at the end because you got fast guys catching slower guys and whatnot. To where you can just get like these long wait times because like everyone shows up at once. But if you get a fast flowing stage, it's like real straightforward and get in and do their thing and get going. And there's like little re- almost no reset. And that's a that's a really good uh, planning on a match director's part because because it just keeps the that match flow going at the kind of a critical area. So all right, Mark uh, eight. So we got one more for you said one more right? Yeah. So one thing that to note for the end about talk about wait times at the end. So bring that back up. Um, Then eight, seven went directly into eight. There were two bays right next to each other for eight. You started at, God, I wish I would have wrote down the distances. This was a little bit of a poke. This was like 18 maybe yards to a dueling tree. And you had it all six plates or it must've been six plates, all six plates, flip them to the other side. And then once you did that run forward and there was like, like a shooting tar or a shooting stand that you would tape or not tape staple a Ipsic cardboard target to, they had the stands up with the target on it and you had to be underneath and between the sticks. So just imagine a box that you have to kneel to shoot through, flip the six again, and then move forward to one more position. This was a barrel with like a board across it, and you just had to shoot either side of the barrel underneath the board. So again, kneeling type position. So 18 total hits, and this one actually kind of got people because those first shots at about, again, 20-ish yards, people struggled with that, especially if you didn't have a dot. And then uh, another thing, about dueling trees and you could talk about competitive equity sometimes people don't hit them square enough to send them all the way around and that gets people all riled up 
when I was running it and when the people were running it the next day that I saw is we just wanted you to hit six. And so if there was one that was stalled halfway, when you got to the next position, show me six. You know, we'd be yelling that to him, show me six. And they would shoot five plus one. And then they'd move to the next position. Usually by then that would knock that one loose. Uh, but a bunch of people timed out on that stage. So that one did get people. Yeah, this was yeah, another not... stage where um, equipment choice mattered um, in the world of ammo. Uh, if you're trying to flip a dueling tree with 115 9 mil at 20 yards, you're going to have a rough day unless you can hit that outer edge. Um, but if you're chucking 147s or something a little bit heavier uh, in your competition load, um, it's a little bit more forgiving there. Like it's one of those, yeah, it's a little bit more expensive to shoot 147s and 115s, um, but it's as authoritative as a nine mil can be. So it might be worth it. And going back 45s to 45s don't matter. 45 <laughs> ACPs don't try, don't have any problem with it, but yeah. This was very similar to a stage that Tiger had at Zombie, I think, last year. Yes. Yeah. And so it was essentially the exact same as that, only you are doing it by yourself. Uh, going back to gear, this is another kind of, not pro tip, but mid-pack tip. So many people on both 7 and 8, because they were higher round count stages, were trying to retain pistol mags. Do not do that on the clock. Let them hit the ground. Keep moving. Your time, you have all the time in the world to pick those up later. Do not pick up or do not retain your mags. Like there's no SOP where there's still targets to be shot and you should be messing around with those. Like let those hit the ground and it will help you on your run and gun scores immensely. So just to add that little tip. Yeah. What we always say on this show run time is cheap, shoot time is expensive. You finish shooting the stage and you shot it in 20 seconds. If it takes you 20 seconds to clean up your mags afterwards, that 20 seconds in a one hour run time is, is nothing. 20 seconds in a, you know, or that extra five seconds it took you to pick it up on a 20 second stage is a very significant amount. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the dueling trees as a match prop. Um, as for reasons you guys kind of mentioned, they, they tend to just be a little bit finicky and not real consistent. And it makes it hard to call. I mean, call, if you want it to flip around and then you hit one up here and Spall gets caught in it. And the next thing it doesn't want to flip. And, um, they're, they're not, they're definitely not my favorite target. I get why match directors shoot them. It's kind of a self resetting target, but I'd much rather shoot hanging plates or, a plate rack and reset it myself than have to shoot a, a, a dueling tree. Cause if it's a six inch plate on it, it's really only like a three or four inch plate. Cause if most of the time they're set up so heavy that if you shoot too close to the bar, it's going to move, but it's not going to flip it. So you really only got that half of that plate to shoot in the first place. So that's, that's kind of my, my thing. So any more we want to add on this before we uh, kind of head to the finish line, figuratively and, I guess, literally? Well, match. we've got stage nine yet, too. Oh, I thought, so you, there's one more. So you got stage. Okay, let's do stage nine. Sorry. Wait, now, thought, John, how did you feel about stage eight? Would, would you say it was on your favorite? I loved stage eight. Uh, <laughs> so Mark r for me on stage eight. And between the first and second shooting positions on that movement, I had a horrible calf cramp that my, like, I like went to duck down into shooting position two and I was going to kneel and shoot from the kneeling so I could move faster later. And I, I bent down or I crouched down and my entire left calf just completely seized up. Uh, so I ended up dropping into prone shooting position two from prone with a pistol, which is fun. Uh, and then gimping my way to shooting position three. Uh, and I, you know, I'm having fun cause I know it's Mark as the RO. So I'm hollering and I'm yelling and I'm bitching the whole time that my calf is going and Mark, I can hear him laughing at me behind me. <laughs> 
it, it was a great stage. It was still fun. Uh, it hurt a lot, and it took a good like three, four hundred yards after the stage for that cramp to actually let go. Um, but that that's on me, you know. Take take the uh, running gels and drink more water and <laughs> you know stretch a little bit and you wouldn't have those problems but it was it was fun it was a good stage it was very yeah mark mark is the worst kind of friend i still have video running around somewhere from a three-gun match where i'd like we we're shooting next to a wall and i had gotten too close and in, induced a double feed and i cleared it and then I'm still, you still kind of had to be close to this wall. And I, I have the film. You can hear Mark in the background. was like giddy, like, oh, he's going to do it again. You know, he was so excited to just like, like a little schoolgirl to watch me double feed my rifle multiple <laughs> times. And I didn't. I was far enough away that I avoided it the second time. But um, I think yeah, you he moved. I think you heard me and moved. We're going to have so to review he's, the he's, footage. I think it's. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he's a bad, he's a bad friend is kind of what I, what I'm, what I'm saying. Yeah. He was, um, we got done. I got done shooting. He's like, man, I thought about recording you and I really wish you wish I did. And I was like, I'm really glad you didn't. <laughs> All right. Uh, on to stage nine then, John, what's, what's up with stage nine? Yeah. So stage nine was actually my favorite stage of the match. Um, this was the other stage where at some point, you had to break the 180. Um, so the setup for this stage is you were in, it was a, probably a 200 yard bay um, with targets at roughly 150, maybe 100. Uh, I was tired by that. It might've only been a hundred yard bay. Um, but you had um, two targets on the left-hand corner of the bay and two targets on the right-hand corner of the bay. You had four separate shooting positions and your start point was in the middle. Um, so your start point, um, before the clock beeped, there was a D4 dice, a four-sided die, um, that you would roll with your cup, and you would leave the cup over it so you couldn't see it. Um, and on the beep, you would lift your cup, look at the number, and that was the shooting position you went to, one through four. Um, after that, after you had cleared that first shooting position, it was your choice, your tactics, how you were going to clear the other three. Um, each of the four shooting positions had two shooting positions at it. So you had a left side shooting position and a right side shooting position. You shot the left side targets or the right side targets, depending on which port you were at, at each shooting position. Um, and the positions were just, they were just good positions uh it was a lot of good movement it was very doable in the amount of time it was 180 second um your position four was a rooftop that they had barricaded down the middle of the rooftop so you had to shoot um from the left side of the barricade and from the right side of the barricade uh and they made the the shooting on the left hand side almost small enough to force you to go left-handed um but i was a like I'm not a small guy and I was able to get into that position to where I could still engage, uh, using my primary hand, um, shooting position three, I think it was, uh, it was either three or two was, you know, the left-hand side, you were shooting over the hood of a car, the right hand shooting position, you were shooting through from the driver's window through the passenger's window, uh, which was a fun challenge. Uh, the other across from that, you shot over the top of a, like a highway wire spool, um, uh, for your right hand side and the left hand side was through a barrel. So you got that nice reverb every time you pull the trigger, if you didn't have a can on of the barrel, just reminding you that you're dumb and poor and you should get a can, um, <laughs> and, which I had shot with my break on a 12, three. So I about rattled my ears off. Um, and then the um, front shooting position uh, was a another barrel with a T uh, two by four on it. And you had to engage from each side of the barrel under that two by four. Uh, it was just, it wasn't an overly high round count. A um, lot of movement, a lot of fun. Um, it was just one that you kind of had to game plan. You had to shout out to the RO. At least I chose to. I don't know if everybody did. I chose to shout out to the RO 
when I was going to be going to that farthest back um, location so that they were able to be out of my way um, and I could ensure that I had muzzle safe direction. Um, good stage. They put really good ROs on it. Um, Sean Burchett was on that stage. Um, he he really kind of ran that stage. He had a, he had some good assistance. Um, it was it was a fun stage. It was a good way to end a match. Um, like I said, it was my favorite stage, and it was a 10k only stage, so Mark didn't get to shoot it. So, eh. <laughs> um, but that said, I really like how they did the match. Um, just to kind of move into that conversation about um, the 5k and the 10k. I really appreciated how they did, you know, the 10K shot all six of the 5K stages at the same point in the match. You know, they'd run a little bit farther at that point. Um, but, you know, the 5K stage one was the 10K stage one. The 5K stage two was the 10K stage two. So when you look at shooting scores, those two matches line up. You know, the 10K guys have gone a little bit farther. So theoretically, they're slightly more tired. Um, but all in all, you can still line those up really well comparatively. Um, and then your last loop, you know, was 10 K only stages. So you didn't have any wait times of 10 cares crashing into the back of five cares. Um, the way that the match directors chose to run this match is they sent every 10 care out on the course first, and then the five K went out in the afternoon. So there was very, there was a very short window about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, where there were stages getting both 10 cares and 5 cares, where there was maybe a faster 5 care and a slower 10 care that was on their loop two, you know, got caught up to by a 5 care. Um, I really liked how that ran and how it kept things smooth. Um, basically, let the 10 cares take their time and they were out of the way for the 5 cares coming through behind. Yeah, that's that's hard to balance um, the runners out on the course at once. And especially when you have two different matches kind of going on like that. Mark, you had wanted to touch back on wait time. Yeah. Do you want to hit that now? Just like what John said. For, so for seven and eight, we had almost no wait time. And stage one, I don't think had any because usually stage one doesn't. And then stage four was right next to us. And they had just a little bit of wait time. But like when I ran on RO day, I had zero wait time. And I think for the most part, I don't think anybody had more than a couple minutes for the total match. And I think if anybody had it, it was on John's maybe stage. Yeah, I think our longest was like 13 minutes or something like that. Okay. Um, but we were at that weird out and back point where we were at basically the farthest point the 10k was going to go and the 5k you know second lap guys were speed demons you know catching up to people at that point um but even even then you know like ultimately a 12 minute 13 minute wait time on one stage of nine um that's that's pretty smooth yeah yeah that's a very very well run match it sounds like they got a good formula going on out there so um John's kind of shared his thoughts. Do you got any kind of closing thoughts here, Mark? No, I just had a great time. Great people. The match, like John said, and we've kind of talked about, runs super smooth, really fun. Uh, and going back to what we said at the beginning, it's a traditional meat and potatoes run and gun. And so it's you go there and you have a good time. Uh, I really enjoy it. And I plan to continue doing it as long as they keep hosting it. So. Yeah, I I liked it a lot. Awesome. Yeah, like it's, it's a it's a haul for us over in this area. How long did you have to drive to get out there, John? Because you're not far from I me. Mean, you're a little more south than me. Yeah, it was about um, avoiding Chicago. It would have been about eight um, to go the long way, eight and a half, give or take. It took us about seven and a half. Uh, we went through Chicago on the way home. We just decided to say you know, whatever, we'll pay the tolls, which speaking of, I need to go back and pay those. Um, but <laughs> hopefully we're still within that 14 day window. I don't think we are, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's not a hard drive for me coming from Southern Indiana, you know, Louisville area. Um, it was basically just jump on I 65 and go to Chicago. 
Um, and then it's, you know, that range is an hour into Southern Wisconsin. So it's, it's a pretty accessible area. Um, they have an advantage They're I, they're going to have no trouble moving forward with, um, like selling out. They have six, seven, eight ranges kind of all within an hour or two from them, um, that they pulled a bunch of local guys. Um, they, they were pulling guys from States that I haven't seen at running guns before. You know, you've got the upper peninsula of Michigan coming down, Minnesota, Iowa, um, there were, I think there were a couple from the Dakotas. They had seven or eight different states that came in for this running gun, which in a, its second year is, that's pretty impressive, you know, to pull from that many different states and to have the word out that much. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just an accessible match. It was a fun match, all in all good time. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, so I'm a little partial, but the people of Wisconsin can't be beat. You know, everywhere you go, the hospitality is next level, the beer is next level, the food's next level, because we put cheese on everything. Um, so like it it's just a great experience. It's a good time. Highly recommend it. So one thing we didn't adding on to the bringing in people from everywhere, I would say, and I talked to like Logan Dudley, that the level of shooter got a lot better this year compared to last year. So I've shot it both years and I think both better shooters showed up and shooters that shot it last year got the game better. Like they understood. So the guy that I worked with is an RO. I think I beat him by like 20% last year. And this year he beat me by five. And I felt like I was as good or better than I was last year. But he said things to me like, oh, I didn't. He thought that your runtime or that all your shooting times were lumped together instead of like stage points for each one. And so if you think that your 20 seconds on that burn it down pistol stage is adding on to your 80 seconds on your rifle stage, like you do things way different than realizing like, hey, I got to burn through these. Also, I think they're, I don't know how long they've been doing this, but I think they're, they've got a decent training group together out there. And so they're working on their skills. Like they're trying to get better out there. It's not just, oh, this is a fun thing that we do once a year. Like they're pushing on this stuff and you could tell as an RO watching people come through and looking at the scores, they definitely, the competition level was definitely better this year. So. Well, well I know from, from running, you know, I'm one of the admins on the uh, RNG discussion, you know, the Facebook running gun group, I guess I, I, there may be more, but that's the, the main one that most people seem to use from like the East coast and Texas and Oklahoma and all those leading up to the match last year a lot of new people were coming into the group and, you know, in the questions there, they were saying like, I'm going to shoot my first match in, you know, Badger and blah, blah, blah. And there's, there's a lot of new people shooting Badger that they'd never shot a match before. And, and then afterwards this show, and then on the page, like from people hearing about it, there's more, you know, I shot my first one last weekend. I shot my first one last weekend, you know, yesterday. And uh, I, so I could see a lot of new people just from that one match last year. Now, you know, there's more that's definitely, I mean, Missouri has, has had zombie and there's um, Loganville's range that runs some of them. But besides for this little pocket in Missouri, you know, a couple there running gun that far north is not really like a thing. So now that they've got this match and it's like people are spreading, you, you may see that spread more. I mean, that's that's kind of what we've seen. It started in Oklahoma and then it kind of filtered down into Texas and then. You know, Matt Stinnett brought it to the Rock Castle and a bunch of people shot that. Now you've got, you know, these multiple matches um, on the East Coast and um, kind of spreading around. And some of that East Coast, I think a lot of the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of those people that ran Badger have shot some of these East Coast matches. You know, I know I've seen Kevin at like Guardian and, you know, I think um, probably Heartbreak and stuff. So, um that's kind of how the sport it's, – it's a very grassroots sport. We don't have a um, national organization going trying to set up, you know, well, we got to get a match out in, you know, Area 5. We're going to make it the, you know, Oregon. We got to get a match in Oregon. It's like, no, someone from Oregon comes and shoots and says, well, this is pretty awesome. I've got – you know, I know someone with a, a range or access. Let's, let's throw one here. So I know we just saw um, – 
I think Utah, we have a friend been trying to set one up in Utah, but I think we just saw there's one going in Utah. I, I don't know if I've heard one that far west yet. So um, very cool that they're kind of building a community up there. And I'm looking forward to seeing how how that spreads because obviously they're putting on a great match. So, uh, any more uh, for your guys' closing thoughts before we? Uh... All right. Well, uh, I appreciate you guys coming on and talking about this. I uh, I would love to get to it one year. We'll we'll see how the schedule goes. It's it's getting kind of life and kids. It's getting harder and harder for me to travel that far. But um, we'll, we'll find out what weekend it is next year. I'm, I'm hoping Legion and that doesn't fall on. Maybe I'll get a chance to to shoot both of them. So um, once again, thanks for watching the action shooting show. I meant to say this at the beginning, but um, please uh, feel free to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel or Instagram, Facebook. So you can kind of keep up what's going on, share it with a friend. We don't um, make any money off this. We're just trying to help grow the shooting sports, grow running gun, grow um, the action shooting sports in general. So we appreciate any help you can give us. So thanks again for coming on, you guys, and uh, we'll see you all out in the range.